And it's a lovely thing to do. Many churches are doing it. You'll see on uh, the presbytery uh, sheet here that it's happening in other parts of the presbytery as well. So it's a nice thing to do if you can make yourself available for a couple of hours, I think, Alan, each, each time. Um, and just be here when people want to talk, then have a conversation with them. If they want to know about the history, there's leaflets at the back of the church. And if you just want five minutes quiet time, just leave them to it. Um, as long as they're not heading back out the door with the church, uh, it's sort of jewelry, you know, that's about, that's the only caveat, I think. But it is a really nice thing to have this church building open for people so they can come visit us to the area and come and see it. Tea and coffee after the service this morning in the church hall, as usual. Our call to worship this morning is taken from Psalm 33. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May your unfailing love be with us. Lord, even as we put our hope in You. Amen. So let's begin our worship by singing hymn 462, The King of Love, My Shepherd is. 462.
For it is to your very throne that we find grace. We find it too at every encounter we have with Christ our Lord. First at Bethlehem, the birth of a babe who would save his people. We find your grace along the shores of Galilee where our Lord prayed, taught, healed and preached. We find your grace supremely at the cross where our Saviour shed his very life blood that our sins might be atoned for and our souls be washed pure from their sin and guilt. We find it at the entrance to the empty tomb as Jesus appears to his own and assures them of his victory over death and hell. Truly, the resurrection and the life. Keep us ever mindful of the great cost of our redemption and ever grateful to the one who paid the price. Keep alive in our hearts the hope he has placed there for life eternal. Hear us now as we unburden ourselves of all the failures and sins of this past week, all that has sullied our union with Christ and our fellowship with each other. In a time of silent reflection, help us to open our hearts to you, O God, and examine them for all the burdens we have placed upon ourselves and upon others, and the grief we have caused your Holy Spirit. He is now in the silence of this moment. May God Almighty, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us. Pardon and deliver us from all our sins. Confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal. Your church has been at various points in our history both fearless and frail, strong and weak, faith-filled and frightened. Throughout all of our history, you have raised up people who have been prophetic, bold and faithful in their witness to you. We thank you for those who have carried your truth as a shining lamp in the darkest of days. For those of your church today whose voices have been silenced in different parts of the world by oppression, persecution and imprisonment, we pray that your grace might sustain them. By your Holy Spirit's presence, be, with, be to them their rock and refuge, their shield and strength. In our prayers, we give thanks for the heroes of the faith, without whose example your church today would be the poorer. Give us the courage to answer your call to follow, like Abraham, to be honest in our prayer, like Hannah, and faithful, like Ruth. Give us the strength to stand up for what is right, like Daniel, to be courageous in our response to God, like Mary, and to trust you completely, like Joseph. Give us the conviction to be bold, like Peter, and confident, like Paul, as we spread the good news. And now we join our voices together with those around the world in the prayer Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Here I am, 
living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. That night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people shall not oppress them any more as they did at the beginning, and I have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. Let us sing again in the hymn book in 252. As the fire is meant for us in 252.
reading is Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 34, then 53 to 56. Jesus feeds the 5,000. The apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. <clears throat> But many who saw them leaving recognised them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. They landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognised Jesus. They ran throughout that whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages, towns or countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and all who touched him were healed. Thank you, Jeanette. Let's sing again from the hymn book in the 342. It says, Jesus, come and gather round. Please <coughs>
see behind Faith Ward, sorry, Faith Ward, is a group of Christians associated with the Reformed Church in America. And they state that their aim is, we want to follow Jesus forward into the future of the Church, wherever that leads us. Let us pray. Almighty God, all thoughts of truth and peace proceed from you. Kindle in the hearts of all people the true love of peace. Guide in your pure and peaceful wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your kingdom may go forward, till the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Almighty God, who through your prophets foretold the day when swords be beaten into plowshares, and who in Jesus Christ made peace through the blood of the cross, pour out your Spirit on all people everywhere, so that we may be delivered from hate, hostility and self-seeking, and find our peace in your will. In your mercy make us instruments of your peace, that your name may be hallowed, your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. We sing again from the hymn book, hymn number 461, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds, 461.
for our ancestors throughout most of human existence. If we assume that modern humans have been on Earth for around 75,000 years, the earliest known cities began to appear about 7,500 BC, so about 9,000 years ago. The earliest known sorry, but these cities didn't last. The ones we begin to hear about in the Hebrew Bible, Jericho, Ur, Nineveh, and Babylon, begin to appear about three and a half thousand years ago. But the vast majority of people continue to live a nomadic lifestyle. Therefore, by the time of King David, it was still called for people to keep their possessions to a minimum, measure their wealth by the size of their flocks, and ensure they could pack everything up and move to a new location on a semi-regular basis. Over recent weeks, we've been following David's rise from shepherd boy and the youngest of his family to become God's anointed one as the second king of Israel. And today we pick up the story at the point when things have begun to settle down after many years of conflict both internal conflict with Saul and his family, as well as the external threats posed by the Philistines and other neighbouring tribes and nations. Now David has been granted peace, and the chance to begin to secure his legacy. He's living in a fine palace, but he's aware that the Ark of the Covenant has been languishing in a tent near a place called Baal Judah for many years. Looked after by the, name, by the family of a man named Abinadad. David has made his home in the hilltop town of Jerusalem. By today's standards, little more than a hamlet, in those days considered to be a city. David felt it was a good time to bring God's ark to be at the centre of his new capital city. And so he consults the prophet Nathan to gain God's permission. David is granted that permission, but he's also told that the ark must remain in its tent. Any plans David had for building a permanent temple would be delayed, and it would be David's son Solomon who would have the honour of providing a permanent home for God's presence. And we've also been a couple of short selections from Mark's Gospel that top and tail the feeding of the 5,000. And they serve to highlight the peripatetic nature of Jesus' ministry. He had no permanent base to work from. And even when we're told in Mark chapter 2 that Jesus was at home in Capernaum, the house was so crowded that four friends broke through the ceiling to lower their paralyzed friend down to Jesus to be healed. In reality, during the period of his active ministry, Jesus was constantly on the move. Travelling from village to village, back and forth to Jerusalem on many occasions, never staying more than a few days, or, as we just read, only staying a few hours in any one place. It's hard for us to even begin to place ourselves in the shoes of David, of, of Jesus and his disciples. Constantly on the move, constantly surrounded by people, constantly being asked for healing and teaching and blessing. I cannot think of a modern equivalent. Yet, for what's reckoned to be the better part of three years, Jesus did just that, day after day, week after week, month after month. There were also quite a moment when he was able to stay to a mountain top or a deserted place to commune with his father to receive restoration and refreshment before the next onslaught. And then there were a few times he was able to spend teaching his inner circle, the disciples. But those appeared to be rare moments of respite in what was otherwise a constant turn of people. In modern times, we've become used to having a permanent home, 
a place where we can retreat to when life is hectic. But for many of our ancestors, those places, those dwellings were only flimsy affairs considering consistent consisting. You can tell I know what they can do. My tongue is getting more and more twisted. Consisting of little more than straw and wood. In communities like Kilreni in ancient times, the only solid structure would have been a church building made of stone and the anchor of its community, while those living around would come and go. Some spending lifetimes here, others maybe flitting in and out. Look around the graveyard, look at the memorials, how many of those commemorate people who travelled far and wide, sailors, merchants, so many others. Some returned to Kareni to retire and live out their old age. Many others never returned in body, but are commemorated here instead. And I know that for a number of you here, you've spent your lives working in other parts of the world or moving around the country to make your living. Again, returning here to your spiritual home to retire and enjoy the fruits of your labor. God refused to let David build the temple in Jerusalem because he knew, he knew his people still needed time to settle down, to truly become a people of a place. The next generation were granted the privilege of building the temple, but it only took a few more generations until the Jewish people had once more uprooted and were taken back into exile. They returned after 80 years, but it took them hundreds of years to restore the temple of God. In the meantime, God continued to be their people despite the lack of a permanent home. Jesus knew what it was to be itinerant, to wander the countryside, and no doubt to sleep in the fields when that, there was nowhere else available. Sometimes we need to be reminded that nothing built by human hands is truly permanent. Only God can offer that level of stability. Our task is to worship God wherever we find ourselves. And sometimes that will be in a building like this. Sometimes it will be in a field, or on a beach, or a mountaintop. Wherever we are, God will be with us. That remains the one constant in our lives. The one thing we know we can rely on more than anything else. Amen. And may God add his blessing to these words. Let us sing again from the hymn book, hymn 123. God is love, like heaven above him. One, two, three.
Let us come together now in our prayers of dedication and for the Lord. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as we bring our offerings to you for dedication, we bring ourselves as well. To be your eyes and ears, your hands and feet, serving and praising your name in all we do. Bless us and bless our offerings, that we may in turn be a blessing to you. Blessed are you, Lord of our salvation, for you be praised and glory forever. When we have erred and strayed, you seek us out. Your love searches for us and desires to bring us home to the light of your presence. As we rejoice in your Son as the Good Shepherd, stir in us the same compassion for others that you have for us, that we may help to reveal your glory in the world. Blessed are you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Loving God, we give you thanks that you have called us to share in showing your compassion to the world. Bless all who are called to be pastors, priests, and ministers, all who preach the word and administer the sacraments. Give to your whole church a sense of mission and outreach, that it may share in your redemption. We remember before you all who we keep retreats and quiet days, and all who help us to see the value of silent prayer and waiting upon you. Lord, we come before you. In you is our peace. We give thanks for all who care for sheep and cattle, all who provide us with food and the necessities of life. We ask your blessing upon all who have been made homeless or stateless. We pray for asylum seekers and refugees. We remember in your presence all who are suffering from hunger or poverty. And we pray for all who are seeking here for them. Loving Father, we give you thanks for our lives and all that we have. We seek your blessing upon our homes and our loved ones. We pray for members of our community who are suffering from loneliness, debt, or the inability to cope with what's happening to them. You are our hope and our strength, O Lord. You come, we come to you for refreshment and renewal. When we are weak, may we trust in your strength. When we are fearful, may we turn to you and your light. We pray for all who are struggling at this time. We remember before you the troubled in mind and the distressed in spirit. We ask for blessing upon friends and loved ones who are ill. And we pray especially for those who have been recently taken into care. And now, Lord, in silence of our hearts, we bring before you all those we know of in need of your care, your compassion, your comfort, and your love at this time. Lord, we come before you. In you is our peace. We give you thanks and praise that through your Son we shall not perish, but have everlasting life. We rejoice in the fellowship of all your saints. We remember before you all the loved ones departed, praying that they may know the fullness of your kingdom. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Let's close our worship in the hymn 110. Glory be to God the Father. One, one, two.
caring hand of God lead you from the bitterness and stress of your daily life to a quiet place, still waters, where you can rest a while and in that space find peace. We ask these things in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit.